Okay. Well, Kate, thank you um, so much for doing lunch therapy. Oh my God. It's an honor. I'm so happy to talk to you again. Last time we spoke was yep. the early days of quarantine. I, think. I know. I feel like we have a virtual relationship. Like it's all very strong. Yeah. Yeah. It's all virtual though. I feel like at some point we'll bring it into the real world. Oh, I demand it. I, I, I can't wait to invite myself over to your home for dinner. <laughs> Oh, well, you are invited. I mean, I'm vaccinated now, so I guess this is going to start uh -oh. happening soon. Oh, hi. Oh, oh my yeah. God. Now it's so awkward. Um, <laughs> so, Kate, I feel like before we get to your lunch therapy, that yes. you, you, you have experience um, analyzing other people in like astrology and things like mm -hmm. that on mm -hmm. your um, various social media platforms. Do you have any advice for? a beginner or somebody who's still early in their lunch therapy days for analyzing other people? Oh my God. Um, for analyzing other people. Well, I mean, like when you do astrology, like, is that just sort of impulse? Like, are you just going off? Yeah. Impulse? Well, I know, I, I always think, you know, the power of the amateur, you know, less, less is more, a little knowledge can go a long way. Mm -hmm. Um, probably bad advice, but I think that, you know, you kind of fake it till you make it. I think, um, I, mm -hmm. like I personally, know almost nothing about astrology but it's <laughs> and I know almost me. nothing about therapy so yeah that's, that's, that's that great. Makes, it makes me feel therapy, good therapy I know a thing or two about therapy yeah. I can kind of get I can kind of get down with and um you know but but uh yeah I think just you know take what works leave the rest as they say <laughs> well I think a great way to start here would be um to ask you about your relationship to food because we began our virtual friendship through um, Instagram, where you sort of revealed that like you like cooking, you like food stuff, but maybe you could talk a little bit about like, you know, oh. your, your passion for all things culinary. When we first spoke, I was, again, the early days of quarantine, and I was channeling a lot of my fear and existential horror into food and cooking a lot. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of, then food became this, like I felt hostile toward the act of cooking, and mm -hmm. it was no longer romantic to me. And I started being like, fuck it, I'm getting takeout, you know, or it's just fine. But then, and then, so there was a period where I really fell out of love with cooking. Yeah. And to be honest, I'm still sort of in that. I kind of feel oh. like I'm, it, it will return, but I, I made a key lime pie two days ago and that okay. was sort of the most dexterous I had been in the kitchen for a minute. And it was quite a simple recipe, but I... I would still say that I love to cook. <laughs> right. But you have a malaise, like a certain culinary malaise. Yes. I think it's just a natural product of, of, of quarantine, but um, yeah, food has always been, I mean, I'm at my parents' house right now and my mother is a really amazing cook and like a very intuitive cook. Like she's not, she would never be like, I'm an amazing cook, but she just is like, she's mm -hmm. just one of those. And I've always marveled at her ability to just like, if she's like, Oh, you know, five people are coming over for dinner. Like it's not stressful to her. Like she can just create, she'll just make like amazing pork chops and like a perfect salad and like a great, she just, and then like dinner is always at like nine 30, you know, that's it's like really a, funny. I mean, that, and, yeah. I used to be so intimidated because like my husband comes from a very like spontaneous, casual culture. And I come from a very neurotic <laughs> Jewish culture where like everything is planned. Yeah. And I think I've finally gotten to this place that only recently where like on Sunday with the Oscars, I had like two friends coming over and I was preparing like to make nachos and I was making a pie. Um, and then at the last minute, my friends, Ryan and Jonathan are like, what are you doing for the Oscars? And normally I would have been in my mind, like, oh my God, like, how could I have two more people come? Like, of I don't course. have enough food. I don't have enough. But I was like, come on over. Like, it'll be fine. Um, and, and then I just sort of put more cheese on the nachos and like put more yes. tortillas. On. It was fine. So very French. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm always striving for that. Like, I want to be that person too. Who's like, oh, but instead I usually have like a white knuckle grip on like a dinner <laughs> or something, or I'm like, yeah exactly who's coming over or my fear of, as you said, not having enough food or something, but I, I strive more and more to kind of relax those boundaries and just be like, it's fine. You know, <laughs> people will be fed, but. Well, it's funny. Cause like your, your brand of comedy is, uh, it feels loose and playful, but there's definitely like a, a craft behind it. And so I, I, I feel like there's something interesting there about like. That's hide the cooking. work. Yeah. Hide, hide the, the work. labor. Hide the labor. Right. Yeah. I always want to, um, yeah, I think hosting <laughs> and entertaining in the home is like my, is like, you know, one of my top three greatest joys, mm -hmm. but it also is something where I feel like I make my labor more visually apparent than I would like it to. Like, I would like to, as I age, 
become better at hiding the work and kind of having it appear to be like, oh yes, of course, oh, yes, <laughs> write them over. What's two more? We'll make room, you know, <laughs> and be able to just kind of appear with a beautiful dish with the, with and like the ability to cook something really great and have a conversation and be drinking a cocktail. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not there yet. Like I'm very much like I have to disappear. Yeah. Right. To like make the food. And then I kind of am like panicked and like, I think visibly stressed. <laughs> like I would love to not do you know that. What, you know what helps a lot is um braising like for hosting mm -hmm. like like uh -huh. stews like anything that like sits in the oven for three hours because you can you can get all the work done like hours ahead and then you just have it yeah. in the oven and it makes the house smell amazing and then you're like oh hey how's it going you know I have a braise in the oven um and you just take that's it out so elegant that's what I have to grab I mean I'm actually I mean, I've been making goddamn pasta for people like it's oh, yeah. the worst thing to do but i did make an amazing like linguine clams um was so good and but that did, was was it like um fresh clams or using yes. can jarred clams or fresh if, clams wow steaming them open all uh, of it yeah it was, like, very magical to me yeah and uh i loved it and i have to say they were delicious my new big crowd pleasing thing that i love to do is that my mom always does which is so simple just roast or not roasting just um you know panko crumbs panko breadcrumbs with some garlic in there make browning them up on the stove and then putting that on essentially everything any salad yeah. any pasta it just it really takes it to the next level and like it's, saves any dish i always forget to do that but it's so true like when you do do that it makes every even salads like it oh some salad crust. Yeah, that's what my mom does in salad, and it's, it really makes like oh, it just like suddenly elevates anything. So, do you ever cook for your mom? <gasps> Almost never, because also when I am here, I just really want to eat her food. Mm -hmm. um, and my mom, I guess, no is the answer. I mean, I have <laughs> certainly she's come to my house and I've made dinner, but uh, normally I regress to the to childhood around her in her presence and I just want to be a baby again <laughs> but what about like <laughs> cooking at her side or like letting her teach you her dishes and stuff like that it's really interesting because I'm always like teach me or something and it just kind of never happens like I mean I've watched her like my friend my best friend John Early would say mm -hmm. that I like I guess I have absorbed information about cooking through living with her and being raised by her and being around her and being around her relationship to food but and she does give me like tips or something, but I guess just through through watching her, I've learned. She is like an interesting detail in my family is that her mother never taught, she didn't teach my mom to cook because she quote, didn't want her life to be about cooking. Oh, so, interesting. Like, she like purposely was like, I don't want you to spend your life in the kitchen the way I did. So I'm not going to teach you how to cook. And then my mom tells me that she, she, you know, had me in her early forties, met my dad when she was like 40 and until then she was just kind of like, I'll have an apple for dinner. Like she was like, this, like, you know, <laughs> like food wasn't a part of her life. And then she, you know, the ball and chain, we, uh, you know, we yeah. made her, her life defined by domestic, the domestic arts. But I kind of take comfort in that. Like, oh, maybe I'll just, you know, she didn't become a, a cook until she was in her forties. So maybe there's, there's still time for all of us. Well, it's so funny. Cause my mother, only really eats at restaurants and growing up like we would just go to restaurants yeah and I you know it's so much of my psychology is not that this is about me it's about you but um, no, no it's about you it's a little, well it's lunch therapy it's lunch therapy um but is about like becoming my own mother in a way like cooking for myself and like nurturing yes. myself mm -hmm. um, but my mom takes it like whenever I talk about that like she takes it as like a huge criticism of her mothering <laughs> but I do think it was like incredibly liberating for her and like perhaps even like a feminist move to like never cook oh yeah and, and to just like be like I only eat at restaurants oh it's so glamorous I love that and like yeah. we did eat out a lot when I was younger and I'm an only child and so going out to dinner with my parents was like a huge part of my upbringing like being mm -hmm. like bored stiff in restaurants like I just have so many memories <laughs> of just like wanting to cry from boredom at a restaurant and like you know having to invent my own like world but I, I love restaurants and but there were certain restaurants I know I would be like if we go there I'm gonna throw up like I would have <laughs> really like what well there was there's a famous story in my family because there was this Japanese restaurant called Noma which now is under new management in Santa Monica and has never been the same but when I was growing up it was this really great local Japanese restaurant and I guess we would go there 
quite often. And I apparently I then started to threaten that if we would go there, <laughs> that I would throw up if we went there. And I do have a memory <laughs> of going once and kind of it came true. Like I, I kind of willed myself into this intensely nauseous state. <laughs> and I have a memory. I, it's that thing where I don't know if it's the memory or the story is so potent in my mind that I fabricated the memory. But my dad tells me that I like went to the bathroom and then came back and was like stumbling into tables, like neighboring tables, like really performing that I was so ill. So much so that we left. That it, wow. ah! Sorry, <laughs> a, bee, a bee just came into my room. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. There's so much <laughs> happening in this story. <laughs> Um, I feel like we have, I have a good... real bee phobia, but anyway. Okay. Um, but then, yeah, but my parents were like, fine, we'll leave. You're going to throw up. And then of course, like upon leaving the parking lot of the restaurant, I was completely fine and restored to health. So mm. I yeah. feel like we could just unpack that story for the next hour. I know there's a lot there. They should have just made me stay, I guess. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, Kate, this is a good moment now to really like open up the the box, the lunch box, oh, yeah. so to speak, and uh, <laughs> and ask you, what did you have for lunch today? Well, I actually even still have it here. So I, I am, um, I'm an advocate for squirrel. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess you need to be uh, post 2020. Yeah, yeah, I'm a squirrel <laughs> advocate. I, um, I live nearby squirrel. And um, I'm sorry, the flavors are undeniable. I love um, the crispy rice bowl with the works, meaning the, the sausage with the scallions and the fried egg and the, and the uh, mint. It's just like just deeply satisfying and crunchy and so good. And it's something that I crave a lot. I've almost had to pull back because there was a period where I would eat it so often that, mm -hmm. you know, it's <laughs> boiled in my mind, but now I'm back on it and it's a, uh, very delicious. So you have a crispy rice bowl with sausage. Yeah, it's crispy. I believe it's called the crispy disco. And it's oh. I mean, kind of like it has everything, but it has sausage in there and an egg, some avocado. And this kind of crispy rice is something that I've never done in my home, which is like each, you know, each grain of rice is like perfectly kind of puffed and, and crisped. Mm. Um, it's so goddamn good. Well, already, like as your lunch therapist, um, the first thing that came to mind was this idea that like you're an advocate for squirrel and, <laughs> and, and, you, and you're, and you're going to go there because that's something you want to do. And it makes me think that you march to the beat of your own drum. Like you're not going to follow trends or fads. It's sort of like, oh, you're yeah. going to do your own thing. But I guess it makes me wonder, like, have you always been uh, so self-possessed or have you always been your own person in that way? Oh my God. I love this. It's the therapy's working folks. Yes. Um, well, it seems kind of like, uh, vile to say that about oneself. Like I, I am, a, I go to my, I march to my own beat. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, maybe, I mean, I feel, you know, deeply aware of what others think of me and want desperately to be loved, but I think, um, yeah, I might, um, I guess I'm a risk taker. But you only really achieve that love by like being your own person in a way too, right? I mean, it's sort of like what people admire about you. Well, I think it is ideally the purpose of life is to become oneself. Oh, wow. This is getting very deep, very quick. <laughs> I mean, we might need yeah. to slow down. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> it's funny. So like when you were growing up, like when you were in high school and stuff with like lunch in the cafeteria and things like, were you the girl with the tray, like not sure where to sit or were you like oh. surrounded by all the cheerleaders? Like, where were you in the lunchroom? I was kind of like, I was definitely, as you might imagine, the class clown, but truly I feel like I was like a manic jester moving from table to table, like trying to like <laughs> entertain the masses. And I act, I do feel that I had that in my youth. Like, I think I, I kind of felt like I could sit anywhere a little bit. That's so funny, manic jester, because I'm not to, again, like this isn't about me, but when I got to college, that was sort of me. Like I was just like constantly like making jokes and just like being and I remember somebody was like, Adam, like you don't have to be on all the time. It's okay. And I was like, Oh. Mm, yes, it was, like, I do. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know where that I think it's like from feeling like an outcast or like feeling like you need to prove yourself. And so that really resonated for me when you just said that about Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. And I think also I've grown like that um that version of myself, the manic jester, like that's not, that's like a deep part of myself that is as valid, as valid and authentic as like me crying, talking about, you know, my pain. Like I feel like yeah. the two, I don't value one over the other. Um, well, Joni Mitchell has that lyric, crying and laughing, it's the same release. 
you know, oh, I don't know. Oh. I forget which song it's from. I feel like it's on blue or something, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same release. But I, <laughs> no, I don't imagine if I just hit Joni Mitchell's like <laughs> you literally cannot sing a Joni Mitchell song unless you're Joni <laughs> 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 unless, you're, <laughs> unless you're Joni Mitchell. Like you can't Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it is blue. It's a yeah. Oh. Whatever. I'm having a laugh. You know what uh, but yeah, I always think about that in, in my therapy because I always feel like my therapist wants me to cry and I never cry. I don't oh, cry. Yeah. So I'm like, but I laugh a lot. So it's the same release according to Jody, Jody Mitchell. It is a huge release. Crying. I've never been a crier, but this year opened up some deep crying in me and it's, now I'm kind of into it. Oh, really? And I have started crying a little bit in therapy. It feels good. No, I think I need to. I mean, I'm sure like that's something that should happen for me, but it hasn't quite. So, okay, back to your lunch. So um, another thing I noticed, oh yes, go ahead. I just was gonna, I wanted to add, cause this is, this is a lunch therapy. This is relevant to lunch therapy is that when I was a child, my mom would pack my lunch in the morning and my mom would make these really incredible lunches, like the mm -hmm. love, like, and I was embarrassed by how kind of intricate they were as mm -hmm. a child. Like, I remember also I would like one of the things that she would give me in my lunch that I really liked was a little Tupperware filled with sprouts, like a <laughs> lemon wedge. Okay. And I would like put lemon on the sprouts and eat them. And like, that is something that I really enjoyed. That was kind of good. Like that's a right, like a nutritionally dense kind of weird thing for a kid to like, mm -hmm. but I was given no parameters or rules around food as a child. Like I could drink Coca-Cola and eat, like I could eat whatever I wanted. And I think because of that, I didn't develop a knock on wood and eating disorder, but also an ability to just like, no food was labeled bad or bad in my, in my childhood, mm -hmm. which allowed me to then gravitate naturally towards sprouts. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> but, right, right. But I, I have a memory of eating the sprouts and feeling embarrassed because it was such a weird thing to be eating. And actually a child was like, what are you, a cow? <laughs> and then I was like, that's like, it's those early injuries are so potent that I remember the shame of that. And then telling my mom, like, please don't pack me sprouts anymore. <gasps> Heartbreaking. Oh my but God. Then, but she would cut my sandwiches into little stars. You know, she had like the, um, like cookie cutters. So I would have little shapes in my sandwiches. And then this is the most luxurious thing during winter, um, <laughs> winter in, in Cal in, you know, Los Angeles, not cold. Sometimes I would have two thermoses, one with the hot soup and one with the hot cocoa. Oh my God. That's very <laughs> luxurious. It's a lot of liquid though. I just have to pee. I would have to pee all afternoon I if I drink that. But yeah. that level, I mean, that makes me sound like a full, like, I don't know. I'm like, oh, it just makes me sound like I was raised in the absolute lap of luxury. But um, those kinds of <laughs> intense lunches I see now is like so much labor that my, like for, to do daily for your child. But that's why it helps to have one kid. You know, one lunch is much more manageable than two or God, God forbid three. Well, it's, it's interesting as it's making me think a little bit about conformity and non-conformity, like yeah. that, that you were, like you were in possession of this beautiful lunch, which is, I mean, it makes me think of your individuality too. It's like you had this thing that was very special, but yet there was this fear of not fitting in. And so yeah. like with the lunches with yourself, I mean, there's, there's something that feels kind of there similar there. there. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, Huh. Okay. Well, we're, we're going deep. We're learning a lot. Okay, uh, so yeah. So um, the other thing about your lunch, so you have sausage in there. And I feel like with the crispy rice bowls at Squirrel, there are a lot of options. And I'm curious, like, why do you go for the one with sausage? I am a sausage hound. <laughs> <laughs> I could take that out of context and like <laughs> make that my ringtone or something. <laughs> I really love sausage. I always have. And I actually want to plug, I have no affiliation with them, but are you aware of this brand? Maybe you're seeing it pop up in cookbook and the like Seymour sausage. Um, no. It's this like small, like artisanal sausage company, but now they're popping up in Whole Foods. Congrats to the group. Um, <laughs> but I saw them in that little artisanal store in Atwater Wine and Eggs. And I was oh, like, yeah. Craig Let compares to us that store is like two dresses, one, you know, from that like Portlandia sketch where it's like, yes, yes. It's like two eggs and like a yes. wine coop. Yeah. It is exactly that. Yeah. And, but the sausage, I was drawn to it, took it home. I ate a pack of that, I mean, it didn't last 24 hours. And they have, I've only had one flavor, but it's like a chicken sausage and it has peppers and mozzarella baked into it. Wow. So it's very like pasture raised, organic meat. Good God. It's really good. So shout out to them. 
And I love a bel campo sausage. I have those in my freezer always. Like I just, I really do love sausage and I love an oven roasted sausage. Like that to me was when I realized I could just take a, a frozen sausage and throw it in the oven and like yeah. she can like put some, put some vegetables on there, make a little glaze, a little honey yeah. glaze, pour it all over there. God yeah. damn it. I also love sausage. I, what I love about sausage <laughs> is um, <laughs> that it is very hard to screw up because there's so much fat in there. Yes. Because it's like very insulated with fat. So it's like you can cook it a long time. You can put it in pasta. You can do a lot to it. You can't fuck it up. And yesterday, actually, John Early made me, I want to say, you know who's become a really great chef in quarantine is John Early. He's I'd love really to have good. him on the podcast and maybe oh, yeah, you must. be a you future guest. Him. Great. I'll, I'll intro. Okay, um, great. He's really come alive as a cook over quarantine and now has the ability to, like, we, he was making dinner the other night and it was very, it was like, I was like, you've achieved the dream of kind of opening the fridge and being like, what shall I make? And just <laughs> made amazing sausage, which he browned with Calabrian chilies. And it was like mixed in and there were some garbanzo beans and he like sizzled those. And it was like, wow. Well, it was just a very simple bowl, but I, like a sausage with a, with a, with a rustic green. I'm in, I mean, that really is a dream dinner, a little dollop of yogurt on top, some herbs, like. So, so what, what is, so like if I were coming over for dinner tonight and you were going to make a meal, like what would you make? Or if it weren't me, like a friend was coming over, like what is, you mentioned pasta earlier, but like you yeah. make clam sauce, but like, what is the go-to Kate Berlant dinner party menu? Um, oh, let me think. I mean, it's, it feels, it feels so sad because I'm like, I don't even know how to answer it. Um, I think right. I really do love a, like a salad, like a, like a hearty salad. Like I like making, um, I like doing a really citrusy, tangy vinaigrette and then roasting some nuts. As I said, putting some breadcrumbs in there, um, maybe some kind of a, of a stone fruit or something if I have it and like tons of herbs. Like I like making like a huge dense salad. As an entree or an appetizer? I guess that's like an actress entree. Oh, uh, actress, actress entree. entree. <laughs> Got it. Yes. That, that, that does sound like an actress entree. Well, it was funny as you were talking about it, it sounded like you were actually doing the thing that you admired John Early for doing, which is like spontaneously mm -hmm. making a salad. Like oh. that sounds like what you were doing. Thank you. I mean, I will say John, John always praises me for my salad and that's like a huge, he's really, you know, sometimes we need our friends to see us and to mirror back to us who we are. Mm -hmm. sometimes, I'll, sometimes I'll get down on myself about my cooking <laughs> in front of John <laughs> and he'll be like, how dare you? Like you invented salad, you know, it'll make me feel better. <laughs> so but, sal uh, <laughs> salad is your milieu. Salad yes. is like your, I love it. Yeah. Like I love, you know, like a roasted, I really, you know what I'd love to do? Here's one thing my mom did. My mom makes really good, simple tahini dressing. It's like tahini with lime juice and soy sauce. Okay, that sounds delicious. Yeah, she does that a lot. And so I'll make that so simple. I and mean, then I love drizzling that over like, you roast the goddamn yam with some spears, <laughs> some, you know, some uh, sumac or something. And then like, voila, that's kind of like a, a good... Um, thing to to serve that's that's delicious i do make a lot of yams like I, oh yeah <laughs> Craig, like, <laughs> my, my husband doesn't like the um texture of sweet potatoes or like yams or yeah. squash so i love it so it's, i love oh yeah. like a jap those little tiny japanese sweet potatoes yeah you can just roast for 20 minutes like with olive oil and salt that with some tahini on top or some zoog uh -huh. you have a little, like cheat like those little just having like really good sauces on hand do so yeah. much Yams. I mean, again, people very close to me truly make fun of me for how much I lean on yams. In fact, the other day <laughs> I was talking to John and I was telling him how I had, I had woken up in the, <laughs> the night. I don't know if this will be funny to anyone but me. I had, I had woken up in the middle of the night, speaking of therapy, gasping for air, like a nightmare or something. <laughs> That's already woke, funny somehow. I don't know why. <laughs> I, told him, I said to him, I said, <laughs> I woke up gasping for yam. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just very funny to, for me to interchange air with yams. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Freud, Freud would say there's something there. Unfortunately, I'm no Freud, so I Both can't. grasping for yam. Yeah, grasping for yam. So I get this sense, I mean, it was funny because you brought this up earlier about like healthy eating or like the sprouts, yeah. but then like the gravitating to fats, but then you just talked about serving an actress salad at dinner. 
<laughs> so I'm curious, like, how do you, how do you negotiate that as an actress? Like in terms of like, do you, do you, I mean, you're having sausage for lunch, you're having salads for dinner, you're having I'm yams. Struggle. I have to, the studio calls, they say, you got to lose 15 by Monday <laughs> or you're off the picture. Yes. Um, no, I, uh, it sounds very like bold and like bullshit to be like, I just eat what I want. But like, <laughs> kind of, I don't know. I feel like, hmm. I don't know. I do, I do tend to intermittent fast, mm -hmm. like not religiously. Like I have no, I have no dietary restrictions tragically, as I always say, but, um, I don't, uh, I, I find, I kind of like, like periods of, I feel like there'll be periods where I'm going out and this is like in the old world, right. Although it's starting to happen again, like going out to eat, eating yeah. late meals, having cocktails, having wine, and it's like, if I'm doing that, I'm doing that. If I go to a restaurant, I'm having absolutely whatever I want. Like, I just don't believe in restriction generally. And I don't, um, my, one of my best friends, Jacqueline Novak and I, we have a podcast called Food uh, Podcast. I'll an incredible food. podcast, oh, which is hilarious. Yeah. But we really rail against this idea of like balance, which I think mm -hmm. is also like kind of a cornerstone of like eating healthy is like balance. And we're both like, no, like we kind of resist <laughs> that and feel yeah. like periods of like, absolute um intense pleasure and like maybe even what would be considered like overindulgence or something like I always want to overindulge I mean like I, I want to live and I want to like have what I want yeah um, totally I think I, I subscribe to the Kate Berlant diet like I think that's exactly what I do like during quarantine I made a cake in the like I'll make I would oh, just like make a cake in the middle of the yes, week or, yes. and uh, the problem is like the more that I've learned how to bake and make delicious things like it got, becomes dangerous because I get these cravings and then I'll just make it and uh I'll have a lot to eat around here amazing yeah to, to have that skill um what is yeah, you, yeah. Oh, yeah go ahead no I I don't know what my philosophy is in, in that way I think um but I do find sometimes that, if, that an intermittent fasting will will kind of get you back and where you need to be well, can you walk me through that? Because I have so many friends. We, I, I, again, like I hosted the Oscars this weekend for some friends and we, Craig was going to make um, cocktails and he had everything yeah. set up. And then like three of the four friends were like, oh, we're not drinking this weekend. We're not drinking no. this. And like two of them were like, well, we just did a fast. And it was just like, oh. it felt like a very LA moment, but. Oh no, I know. Intermittent fasting and people there, there are like genuine, like, I think again, I'm going to like butcher this because I only have like, four sentences of information that I like read at 4am on Instagram, but yeah. it, it, like it can help with digestion and stuff like that. Oh yeah. Intermittent but, fasting. Now I remember my mom did this and like, you, it's just like at certain hours of the day, you don't eat. The idea is kind yeah. of like, you don't eat for 14 hours, but you're asleep for as, uh, for most of that. Right. I mean, if you're mm -hmm. like me, you're asleep 10 hours, you know? Yeah. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, wake up, you have coffee, whatever. I mean, the truth of the matter is I'm just not really hungry when I first wake up. Yeah. Is that a lie? I think it changes. Sometimes I wake up ravenous and I'm like, I need pancakes now. And then sometimes I'm like, oh, I just, I don't know. I mean, all the stuff around talking about like eating or intuitive eating, it's all just like, you can't, it's like all immediately absorbed into like diet culture hell. Yes. Um, but I don't, I don't do like, I don't like cleanses. I don't do juice cleanses. I hate that. I really, I'm someone that really can't stand to be hungry. Like I just, I can't suffer that. Um, is that because you're are you Jewish? You're Jewish, right? Yeah, I'm half I'm, I'm half Jewish, half Spanish, possibly fully Jew. We don't know due to um, being Spanish. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm Sephardic. Sephardic. Well, it's funny because like I feel like fasting in Judaism was always this fascinating mm. thing, and it's actually going to be interesting for listeners of my podcast because I had my mom on season one and she made me stop recording at a certain point. And if you listen to that podcast, she, she said, I, I come back and I'm like, there were technical difficulties, but the reason she made me stop recording and people are going to like lean in when they hear this was because I was telling the story when I was growing up um, during Yom Kippur, when you're supposed to fast, like I would try to be a good Jewish boy and fast, but then my mom would make me eat. She'd be like, you have to eat. You have to eat. <laughs> I love that. But then she like made yeah. me stop recording. She's like, I don't want that out there. I don't want people to Not know for that. The Jews. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. yeah, but it was so funny, but that conflict of like, trying to fast, but then like being Jewish and like not wanting to be hungry. Like it, it feels like this like internal war within us. Totally. And I was like, I was never, I never had to fast or I did maybe a couple of times like for fun, but I was raised with like no religious obligation whatsoever. Like I went to Hebrew school, but then was like, 
dropped out because I wanted to do the school plays and my parents were like yeah that's fine like there was no <laughs> I, I actually kind of was hungry for some kind of obligation like that like I I kind of was like always romanticized going to my friend's house whose parents were like we're fasting or you have to be home by this time or like you know you, you have to have a bat mitzvah <laughs> I yeah like, I wish I had that kind of but um but yeah fasting is 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 interesting but yeah I, I'm, I'm definitely a hedonist yeah. And um I think that yeah, I just depriving oneself just kind of usually leads to a lot of trouble, I find. I agree. Well, okay, maybe a more fun question then is like when you are being hedonistic and you are like feeding yourself, you know, yeah. with abandon, like what do you gravitate to? Like where do you go? What do you do? Like what, what would be like, where? Oh, I was gonna say Italian food. Oh, Italian food. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. like pasta, tiramisu, pasta, um pasta, yes. I mean, I love yeah, I mean, I think one of the meals I was really craving in quarantine was to go to Jar. Oh, I um, love Jar. I love the wheel, the chairs on wheels there. You love can just like, jar. wheel all around. It's so good. It's one of my favorite, just like, talk about, talk about direct cooking. You know, it's just like really so goddamn good. It's a steakhouse. Um, and so I went there. That was like the first outdoor meal I had um, with some friends, including John and we went full, you know, martinis, filet mignon, onion rings, mashed potatoes, cream spinach, all of wow. it, duck, <clears throat> duck fried rice, you know, banana cream pie. You know, that's like yeah. what, I, what I want. That's like a meal that I really want. They, they make a lychee teeny there that I actually replicated for John's birthday in quarantine. And I have to say, it's so goddamn. It's like drinking an angel's bath water. It's so good. <laughs> How do you make it? Oh, okay. So you get, you just want a really good vodka. Um, you, you get lychees like in the can, Yeah, which are kind of expensive. I have to say, you know, it's not, it's not the cheapest thing in the world. I love lychees though. I think they're I so delicious. Lychees. Yeah. And I used to eat lychees as a kid. I'm realizing now I'm like, oh, I ate a lot of, like a lot of my childhood was like opening up a weird can in my pantry and like eating it. Like I used to eat lychees out of the can, those little mandarin slices or like um mm -hmm. baby corn like i feel like i it's all coming back my childhood is here the yeah Black i feel like we need to talk olives. about i mean yes. once once you tell us the recipe i feel like we need to go into like your mother's kitchen like okay, meta great. Meta metaphorically not yeah. like actually because well you know, i actually think i might take you in um, oh really i love that <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah. but uh uh oh, oh yeah so the lychee teeny you just get a nice like quality you know can of lychees you pour you can you uh put some of the, the lychee juice in a shaker with ice with a splash of like a nice dry vermouth shake it to hell mm -hmm. I mean it is so good and it goes down it's like one of those things where you're like oh it's going to be terrifyingly easy to like consume like four of these yes because they're just it's so good and light and um and then you pop a couple of lychees in there it's like a gorgeous little cocktail and lychees are one of the few fruits where I feel like the canned version is more enjoyable than like Absolutely. the fresh version because yes. I've, I've bought like fresh lychees and had a very difficult time. Um, but the canned version is delicious. Mm, 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 okay. Mm. So let's talk about your mother's kitchen. Um, like growing up. So, okay. What were the smells? What were the the dishes? Like what, what, were, what was she making for most of your childhood? It's, it's funny because there's this one thing it's, it's weird what you latch onto like flavor wise or smell or like, um, like there's a, this one thing I have to like, I want to like ask my mom now she has it. She used to make this chicken that she would um, like with this certain kind of jar. It was like an Indian lime based. It was like some marinade. I have to ask her, I think it like discontinued. Like it was something that she just like always bought at the local supermarket, but that's something that's so burned in my memory. It was so good. This like tangy, like dark um, chicken marinade, but she made um, ropa vieja. Oh, wow. Was, like, so good. And like, um, you know, just like really kind of like stringy beef with braised with tomatoes. And, and um, that was that was a big one. Again, the salads. Um, she would fry chicken. She would fry oysters, but I was always never wanted to eat them, but she would eat them. Wow, that sounds very delicious. Like, like that sounds uniquely like gourmet for a home kitchen. Oh, you're you're taking me. Okay, so the, well, I just the, want to tell you because honestly, I really think my my parents' kitchen is like 
Okay. It's like really fun. And if you're listening to this, what it's so cute. Um, if you're listening to this, I'm gonna show this portion, this video portion on lunch therapy on Instagram. So um go on Instagram and I'll post this when the podcast Cook, airs. Cookbook, okay. Cookbooks. Look, there's, there's cookbooks on a shelf above. Okay, beautiful. I Japanese love the wood. Tansu. It's yeah. really it's like a it's a small kitchen, but it's like very like this is kind of the space is just this, but it's amazing what she's able to do. And is, it, is this your your childhood kitchen? Like this My is the same kitchen. This is the same kitchen. This is the pantry that I would look. See, look at these canned. Do you know, like oh my god, my mom, which I really appreciate, which is like, it's not. I don't know how to describe it. It's just um, yeah, You're going in here. Yeah, it looks like that's the kitchen of somebody who really cooks. Like it's not just yeah, a, like bu that. a bunch of random things. It's like things that she actually probably uses. Oh, oh my god, I, what is behind you? Like what's behind you? Is that a cabinet? We don't talk about what's behind me. This, <laughs> this is a laundry room. Oh, it's a laundry room. Like, it's a laundry room. Okay. But um yeah, it's just like very um it's just cute. She has all her like little bowls here. I love it. And it's like very I think it's a beautiful kitchen. And again, it's small, but it's just like there's a lot of there's a lot of fun here. There's a lot of pleasure to be had here. What's in the fridge? Oh, good one. Yeah. I mean, since we're in, you know, I know most people are probably just listening to this, but the kitchen is sunlit. It's wooden. There's a fridge filled with ingredients. There's not, like, this is very my mom, like ranch. Like, like she, she finds like, you know, look at this. There's a thing of Grand's biscuits in here. Um, <laughs> champagne, always, always an open bottle of, of a brute or a cava. Of some really? Kind. And always an open bottle? Oh yeah. We're going, <laughs> we're going through a lot of cava in this house. I love that. That's, That's so celebratory. All my mom drinks. My mom, my mom, she, the only thing she drinks is sparkling, is like kava. That's so, I love that. That's so festive. You'll never see her with a glass of wine. You'll never see her with liquor. So does your mom have a similar personality to you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would say, yes. My mom is very, um, but, but yeah, she's very charming. My mom is, is definitely dramatic. Like she is an entertainer. She really is. Um, uh, yeah, I think I got her, her level of drama and kind of like storytelling or something is, is very something I think I inherited from her. And she really is like me and that she's totally a hedonist and kind of just like really wants to have fun. And mm -hmm. um, I think probably her favorite thing is my favorite thing, which is like going out to restaurants or dinner parties. So what does it do for you psychologically? I mean, it's so funny to see your kitchen. Um, if you went to my mother's kitchen, you would see like diet sweetener, like bagfuls of like sweet and low, like a curry yeah. coffee maker with like yeah. Starbucks pods and then like dietetic creamer in the refrigerator, like, <laughs> and like cut up yeah. fruit from like Publix in Florida. Yeah. I think that would be it. So, but I guess what, how do you think it affected you psychologically to have a, a mother who cooked for you so lavishly and lovingly? Like, what did that do for you? I know I, it's such a good question because it's something I don't really think about that often I think it was like it's an it's a tremendous amount of care and like a like and also creativity like it just was never um yeah I think it was a way that I definitely clearly received love and like the feeling of um being cared for but also of it being like connected to like pleasure and mm -hmm. fun like I I I was, I was protected from the burden of what it was to raise me. <laughs> like I never, I don't remember my mom being like, God damn it. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, um, I'm trying to think. Yeah. I think it, uh, it definitely bonded me like to her. And I think my, again, I'm an only child, but my, my dad, we would, it would always be the three of us for dinner and like, again back to the only child thing like deep memories of being bored stiff at the dinner table like yeah oh god you know like wanting to die because i like had you know feeling just like why isn't there another kid here or something but <laughs> but uh yeah that's like definitely a big part of my psychological yeah uh, foundation well i feel like you it, 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 i mean just from my perspective it feels like it allowed you to take more risks and like to take big swings with your comedy and your career because it's like you have this very safe place to come back to oh totally I'm so like 
it's an embarrassment of riches. Like I'm deeply lucky. I'm I'm securely attached for Christ's sake. I mean, <laughs> who the hell can say that? Wow. Although of course, certain relationships, I, I I tend to be more anxious. Um, you know, <laughs> someone's avoidant that brings up a lot of me. But uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, did your dad cook at all? Was he into food? Never has he cooked. He um very classic kind of ingrained gender roles in that department. Yeah. My dad loves food. is is obsessed with food. is very has always been very food focused but in a very sweet way like his real like nothing he thinks my mom's cooking is the best and mm-hmm. but almost like in a very real way like almost like a child like <laughs> like I have so many memories of going to like really good restaurants and my dad being like it's not as good as mom you know uh, like, like, but him like actually being kind of pissed like <laughs> that's so sweet though that's so it's, nice it's very sweet but also sometimes I'm like you're wrong. You know, I was like, like, oh, God bless. Like my mom's cooking is great, but even like, we're just objectively like, this is like a crazy meal, but um, yeah, he's very into my mom's cooking. And my mom, when I was growing up, would go on trips sometimes with a friend and my dad would be with, you know, when my dad and I would go to Sizzler, we mm-hmm. would go out to eat a lot. And then also, but I have these memories of being in high school and my dad, like knocking on my door, being like, it's dinner and coming in with a piece of toast and a can of like Progresso chicken noodle soup like in a bowl and just uh, being like this sucks <laughs> like feeling like a brat who's so like yeah this is, this is not a pork chop you know did but, you go through a phase like when you became a teenager where like you like rebelled by like not eating your mother's food or were you always a gracious child it was such a little like I I never I never had that um period really in high school of like get out like I was like ah. <laughs> Like I was like a little pathetic. <laughs> I never rebelled. Um, but uh, no, I don't remember that really ever happening. Yeah. Well, it sounds, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm jealous. I, I, you know, I shouldn't really reveal that part of myself in a professional <laughs> context, but I, um, I, yeah, that sounds like a lovely childhood. <laughs> Here I am. So well, how, did you, how did you get so screwed up? I'm <laughs> just kidding. I know, no, truly. Well, you know, it's a lot of darkness that I'm not, that I'm not sharing on lunch uh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I, uh, I, it's, it's true. It really was. I can, you know, there's, there's always issues. There's always darkness and there's always dysfunction, but the backdrop of the dysfunction, I have to say was, was quite marvelous. Before we move on from your lunch, I mean, we have sausage, we have rice. Um, you were talking about the grains of rice being puffed up in a way that you can't do at home. Uh, and I don't know, like, what is that? Like, if you were, I mean, I can try to analyze what that means, but like for you, like, what does that bring up in terms of like, you know, your inability to puff rice? Yeah. What is that? It's like, are you putting limits on yourself? Are you? Rest- Probably. Yes, totally. And it's like, no, I want to do that. Why do I feel, I think I, I do have a habit to overcomplicate things that probably are not that complicated or um, something that I deem is like beyond my ability. And yeah. Like or like getting in your own head or getting in your own way. If totally. that's yeah. Totally. So what are you? Yeah. What are your like Mount Everest food things? Like what are the things you haven't yet conquered? Well, it's funny. I was scared to make the linguine with clams. Oh, okay. I was like, I was like, who the hell do you think you are? You're going to go down there and buy clams and steam them open and not poison someone, you know, but it was really delicious. And I was like the sauce, I'm not going to get the glossy sauce that I want, you know, it was all, but it worked out. Okay. So what do I, um, what do I long for? Well, I love what you're saying about braising. Like I would love to yeah. just, I would love to nail a couple more of those dishes to have people over that I could just do and, and you know, have and walk away from and participate in the party more. Um, what do I, <laughs> your, I sound, your sound, your sound, making you sound like a robot, but it's okay. Keep going. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Yeah. I, um, I was going to say that I, I, I don't cook much meat at my house. Like oh, I, okay. I eat meat, but I kind of don't buy meat aside from sausage. And yes. so I would sort of be curious to, uh, to do that more. Like, I, I feel like handling chicken has always kind of freaked me out. Uh huh. And so I would like to get, to get over that. Chicken is great. Well, you know, Jacques Pepin says you don't have to rinse it because. Um, oh yeah, the, the, I was I was raised on never rinsing a chicken. Yeah, don't rinse it. Just get it. I have the recipe that like people make for me, but they make fun of me because I put like a stick of butter on the chicken, but it makes it golden and beautiful. And you just put vegetables underneath it, and it's incredible. You know what chicken? What gross chicken recipe changed my life? 
and this is a, this is a crowd pleaser is Thomas Keller's. Yeah, that's the recipe. That, that's what I do. I take the credit for it, but it's Thomas Keller's recipe. Yeah. Well, the one that I do, he says nothing, no butter, nothing. All you do is you pat it dry, you uh, get it so, yeah. so, so, so dry. Okay, this is killer. You get it so dry, and then you just rain salt on it, salt and pepper, yeah. truss it, put it in a really, really hot oven. Don't open it. Don't you dare open it. And it makes the crispiest, most succulent chicken in the world. Oh, see, the one I do is from his ad hoc cookbook. And it's mm. like, and what's so amazing about it, the secret to that recipe is that it has nothing to do with the chicken. And it's all about the vegetables. So you put Yum. like onions, um, rutabaga, parsnips, potatoes, uh, garlic, thyme, olive oil, uh, canola oil, actually, salt and pepper, and you toss that all together. And then you put a chicken on top of it. You stuff that with thyme and lemon and garlic. And then you slather the chicken in butter more salt and pepper and then all that butter and chicken fat and oil like ensconces those vegetables oh, and they they get so crispy and it's truly like one of the most divine things you'll ever make in fact every episode of Funch therapy i end up promising the guests that i will make <laughs> i will make a specific dish that make we that. talk about but i will make that for you when you come over oh my gosh. it's an all-time classic okay. um well kate you've been so generous with your time we're at the final stretch we have 10 minutes left yeah. and i begin every session by asking what did you have for lunch but i end every session by asking what will you be having for dinner tonight that's so fun um <laughs> oh god tonight's gonna be very unglamorous i feel like i am I'm probably just going to open my fridge. Do you know this? I have this like this trout, this um, smoked trout in a can. That's really good from this company, Fishwife. Oh, I've and heard of them. They wrote me a message on Instagram. They wanted yes. to send me stuff. Yeah, yeah. They sent me a couple cans, if I may. <laughs> and uh, I have to say the smoked trout is really good. So maybe I'll do some kind of a, I have a good sourdough bread at home. Like that's one thing I love having like a really good loaf of bread. So. Maybe I'll do like make tr smoked trout on toast or something. Delicious. Like, I love toast for dinner or just toast generally. So in terms of like the heaviness of your meals throughout the day, would you say you peak at lunch or do you? Oh yeah, a lot of grains, a lot of, it's a, it's a heavy grain day. I, I love having, I love having a really heavy early dinner. Like that's oh. one of my favorite way to eat. Like I love, I feel like for so many years I was always having dinner at nine o'clock, you know, and then or growing up, we always ate dinner at like 9.30. But now as I age, I really <laughs> enjoy like like a six o'clock or 6.30 dinner reservation somewhere where you can just really eat your heart out. And then by the time you go to bed, you're kind of okay. You don't, you're not like yeah. getting to bed with like a full stomach. That's I really like smart. That. Yeah. Um, so to you can do toast for dinner. Do you put anything on besides the, the fishwife smoked trout? Yeah, I'll do, um, I have an amazing grassy olive oil from my, um, my aunt's farm, Frog Hollow Farm. They make an incredible olive oil. I and think this came up last time I spoke to you. So your aunt has a farm. I always will name drop Frog Hollow. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, don't they do peaches too? Yeah. They're famous for their peaches. They do so much. They do so much, but they really, they have a really beautiful olive oil. And is it your mother's side or your father's side? My mother. This is her sister? It's actually it's a little complicated. It's my, it's not really my aunt. It's my first cousin, okay. but I call her my aunt because she's like, you know, 30 years older than I am. So, Got it. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was just wondering if it came from your mother's side because your mom is such a good cook that like there was this culinary gene. There, that... there is, there's a, there's a lot of food on that side and like a lot of amazing culinary talent. Like my mom's sister, who I call grandma, hold on to your hat. Um, Wait, but... what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I call my, I call my aunt grandma always did. And um, she's now in her early nineties. I mean, she's incredible. She's like completely independent. Like sharp as a goddamn tack it's crazy um and she's a fantastic cook okay and yeah so she, she's amazing and like her daughters and her sister my mom like everyone really can cook did you know that when jack nicholson was like in the middle of his life he found out that his mother was his grandmother and that his sister was his mother uh no i did not know <laughs> that wow because it was a scandal, I guess, that like his mom got pregnant so young. So like to bury the scandal, <sighs> they like, he, they pretended that she was his sister. That is, that's really alarming to find out your sister is your mother. Yeah. It's in Angelica Houston's um, autobiography, Watch wow. Me, which is a wonderful audiobook. I heard, yes. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow.
Well, I mean, so it's olive oil. It's the sourdough. Do you toast the sourdough? Yeah, I said, I'll toast the sourdough. I'll toast the sourdough. I'll, you know, maybe rub some garlic on there, which yeah. really does do a lot. Um, I'll do olive oil. I'll do the smoked trout, maybe some like um, Greek yogurt or something. I mm. love making like a labna or um, yeah, something like that would be nice. And then just like pepper and a good, a good flaky salt and you're ready to go. You know, it'd be good on there um, if you want a little homework, therapy yeah. homework, um, slicing some red onion and like putting, like pickling it quickly, like a pick, quick pickled red onion. Quick pickle. I work, so I work with a lot of smoked trout in my kitchen. And so that mm. I find that really helps and elevates the toast because it gives it some acid. Oh, I see that completely. See, that's an example, quick pickling. There was a period when I was in my early 20s and I was living in New York City and I was obsessed with Smitten Kitchen. Oh, yeah. And I, would, like, record, I would cook all her recipes. and She's been a guest on Lunch Therapy. I know, I know. Oh. And I would quick, and she had like, I remember a recipe like quick, like pickling grapes. Like I would like, oh. I would really do a, like, like St. Louis, like butter cake, like things that now would really intimidate me. I really did. Like she, she pushed me to make pizza. She pushed me to make, like galettes and tarts. I mean, I really, I owe her a lot. And then I kind of. I, yeah, she's yeah. very accessible, but ambitious at the same time. Yes, I think I even talked about her maybe last time I, I spoke to, to you because I once saw her at the under St. Mark's Market, I think is now gone. But I saw her there and I was like so starstruck. Oh, I, was, I bet she would have loved that. I'm sure she's I know, a good I don't fan remember, of yours. I don't remember if I said anything. I don't know. But. Well, with a quick pickle, I mean, you could be very casual about it. You can be John Early-esque and yeah. just take some vinegar, put it in a bowl, put a little sugar and a little salt and a little water, yeah, and then just slice an onion, put it in there for an hour, and you'll have a quick pickle. God, see, that's great. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, not everyone loves pickled onions on things. I mean, it, I love pickled everything. I'm, I'm really into to pickles. How do you stuff. feel about capers? So... <laughs> I feel so much about keepers. Like you just hit on something very deep to me because truly in high, in high school, I had a friend that made a joke that my, 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 <laughs> your mom's going to get called a man who I don't recognize. Uh -oh. and, um, <laughs> I, um, when I was in high school, my friend would joke that my, my, my AOL screen name should be caper hottie. Cause I was so obsessed with capers. Okay. Really? Capers. I used to eat, this is again, goes back to me being like a child in this home in my mama's pantry. I would eat capers with a spoon. Oh my God. Wow. I really hit on something here. I would no, I love capers. I love capers. What did I just recently? <gasps> was it your recipe? I went over for dinner. Yes, it was your recipe. I went over for dinner at my friend's house and her boyfriend made your big ziti. Oh, wait. With capers? Yes. Oh, was it like a ziti with cauliflower? No, but no, I think it was your, maybe it wasn't your recipe, but you came up because he was like, oh, like we were talking about, about, about you. I thought it was your recipe. Oh my God. Was, wow. My ears were capers. burning. Wait. He added, he added capers to a big ziti and it was really good. Oh, okay. That makes sense. I don't think I put like, cedars, capers plant. in my big ziti, but I, yeah. but that sounds like a good, like it, it sounds like. Eggplant with oh. the capers. It was really nice. But I, oh I wait, it. maybe that was Nancy Silverton's um, egg. Well, that's an eggplant lasagna, though. That's eggplant lasagna. That's different. Wait, um, your screen name was going to be Caper Hottie. Yeah. I kind of feel like that should still be your screen name. Like <laughs> you should change your handle to Caper Hottie. No, my my screen name growing up in, in middle school and into high school was Share Stole My Face. <laughs> that was my. Um... That's a good one. Um, well, Kate, I feel like we ended on such a good note because we got onto the caper thing and you kind of lit up and we learned a I lot really more. I really lit up around the capers. I mean, because it's just, it's really a, it's, it's, a, it's deep for me. Capers go deep. So if, if um, did we cover everything for you? I mean, do you feel properly therapized? I honestly do feel therapized and I feel like I'm, I have this like renewed kind of sense of gratitude for my, my mother, my childhood. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I was really struck by the the cafeteria um, manic gesture of it all, but then this like safe place that you came home to with like delicious food and then like making peace with the, um, what you call it, the pea sprouts or the, the sprouts yeah, with the, the sprouts. lemon. Yeah, yeah. that these, yeah. and then the capers that you were eating them from the jar. You, mar <laughs> you march to the beat of your own drum. We circle back. It's true, it's true. No, this was very revealing. All right, well, you'll come over. Um, I'm going to Florida to visit. My parents are here. I'm seeing my parents tonight for the first time in one and a half years. Oh, 
wow. So that's going to be crazy. Are you going to cook for them? No, they don't like, they don't like eating at anyone's house. They like to go to restaurants. Oh, that's Ooh, okay. okay. Who's Jill, mom? Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, of course your mom, you want to go out. Where are you, where are you going? They like, steakhouses or going to boa steakhouse in beverly hills oh my god well don't be surprised if somebody calls and picks up the check can you imagine <laughs> <laughs> if i that's, were like that's yeah that's so funny you say that because i've i've done like some stuff in my life where like my parents should be proud like you know i didn't done some cool things yeah but nothing like that amazing um but my dad I, had gotten like good medical news like a, a couple of months ago and they went to a steakhouse to celebrate and I called the restaurant I was like I want to pick up the check like oh. so when they when they get the bill like I want to pay for it and that was the proudest they have ever been of me they were just like bursting with gratitude and joy. they were just like oh my god I, I couldn't believe it when, the, when they told us that you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that is so sweet that yeah. you're, you're a good you're a good son no but that, well, and yeah. that is a great feeling like to do something like that is like is is very dreamy like I remember when my Jacqueline Novak took me out to dinner for my birthday and like this was like when I was like 24 or something and she picked up the check and I just oh. like, couldn't believe it. It was like, I was like, what? <laughs> like I, I would yeah. never have even considered that. Picking up a check is huge. I think it's a generational thing too. Cause I think for my parents' generation, maybe your parents too, like it took on so much significance. Like yeah, now right, we have like, like Ven we have Venmo now. Like we have things now where it's like a little more cash, like, oh, I'll Venmo you or, you know, but I feel like, it, in yeah. like that and to pay for your parents' meal. That's beautiful. Oh, I'm well yeah, we're well, going to pay for our meal tonight. So thank you in advance. Yeah, pay for your meal. When you get the dessert, just know it was me. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Well, um, well, thanks so much for doing lunch therapy and I'll see you here for roast chicken in a couple of weeks. I can't wait. All right. Have a great day. Bye.